Star Wars The Last Jedi is the most embarrassing thing since my son. No, no, my other son! The son that's so embarrassing I never even talked about him. His name is Ryan Johnson, and he's a filmmaker from Los Angeles, California. In all honesty though, after lubing up The Last Jedi and subjecting it to a very deep and tight analysis, I have discovered that it is a slightly more complex and interesting film than I first thought. Complexly bad. Get up, we gotta go! It both succeeds and fails for me at the same time. Kinda like falling on your face at the finish line of an Olympic race. And maybe shitting your pants at the same time. That's The Last Jedi. That was also my cousin Howard at the 92 Barcelona Olympics. He later became an alcoholic and then crashed his car into a Burger King. When his car exploded, that made him die. You could say he was flame broiled. What a sad ending to a man who famously shit his pants in front of the whole world. Anyway, speaking of famously shitting your pants in front of the whole world, number one, Ryan Johnson and how this all happened. Disney, Lucasfilm, Kathleen Kennedy, whoever, whatever, gave my son the most important sequel in a billion dollar franchise. He really only made one other movie in the genre, and it was called Looper. It was pretty okay, I guess. Other than that, he hasn't done too much. He used to mow my fucking lawn. One time he added fertilizer to my overgrown grass and made it worse. He told me he was subverting my expectations. I told him to go fuck himself. I fired him and I didn't let him mow another lawn again. <coughs> now my son was given the unenviable task of having to follow up The Force Awakens with his own film. We all know that The Force Awakens was a soft reboot of A New Hope, so all the internet fingers of blame were all prepared to point right at Ryan and accuse him of doing the same thing with Episode 8, which was that he was going to make a soft reboot of Empire. And for a while it seemed to be that. And he knew it. Here we had a movie set after the destruction of the First Order's super weapon. Rey was seeking out a Jedi Master for training, about to discover some kind of family secret or lineage. The Rebellion was running and uh, gonna get betrayed and then go into hiding again, etc, etc. So one can't necessarily blame my son for trolling the audience and quote, subverting expectations. The whole thing of a scoundrel and the audience expects him to have a heart of gold. My right. intent is to cast someone who you would not expect to see. It's the only thing I would really want is a good movie that delights me in ways I didn't expect. Not getting what she wants. Not getting the answers from the places she thought they were going to come from. Like, oh, that's completely different than I thought it was. But my question is, why troll the situation at all? Why not take the audience in an entirely new direction? Oh, I guess because there's nowhere to go with Star Wars. Because it's boring. It's played out, and it sucks. Lucas is laughing all the way to the bank with this $4 billion check. God bless you, George. You enjoy your food court meals, you sweet, sweet man. Anyway, the similarities first started with the trailer. Vader and Kylo Ren alone on a mission to find someone. I guess we'll call him Vaderin. AT, AT walkers preparing for an attack on what looks like a snow planet. Vaderin entering with snow troopers. Rey training with the Jedi Master on some kind of green place filled with life. Rey confronting her fears in a secret cave. Vaderin force senses somebody on a ship and so on. But when you see the movie, the snow planet battle is at the end. And oh my god, it's not snow at all, it's salt. Salt. You're gonna rub that in our wounds, son? Hey, wait, is that Gareth Edwards? Put a fucking helmet on, you stupid prick. No one cares that you have a cameo, you boring ass cracker. Jesus Christ, how full of themselves are these guys? 
Someday this war is going to end. <laughs> Not the Star Wars. That will never end. That will keep going forever. Keep going forever? What the fuck? Son, you may have single-handedly ended it. Oh. A surprise, Rey doesn't get trained by Luke at all. And her family lineage isn't a shocking secret. You have no place in this story. You come from nothing. You're nothing. And there's no real lightsaber fight at all. At least not IRL. It's all a hoax. Oh my god. Seriously though, this guy literally just did pretty much the opposite of what we expected. Did he think all this was gonna blow our fucking minds? The only thing that could blow my mind is a giant pile of Tony Montana cocaine. God, I miss the 80s. The 1880s. That's when you could get the real good stuff. The 1980s was okay, I guess. But I'm really looking forward to the 2080s. Digital 3D printed cocaine sponsored by Disney. Snort up before you see Star Wars Episode 47, the last, 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 last. But wait, there's more. Yes, failure, most of all. You see all this shit that I've just talked about? It's what we know already, and what we've complained about ad nauseum. The whole internet collectively has complained about subverting expectations. Out of place your mama joke. About his mother. Porgs. Luke throws a lightsaber over his shoulder. Coyotes made of crystal meth. Stupid kids. BB-8 is a slot machine that shoots coins at people. <laughs> Luke milks giant dinosaur tits. Stupid kids. Kylo Ren wears old man high-rise pants. Luke Skywalker drinks milk from dinosaur tits like a homeless slob. Leia flies like Peter Pan in space. Stupid kids. <laughs> Cartoon alien horse donkeys. Purple hair lady in a prom dress. Luke tells Rey that Jedi aren't special. That force does not belong to the Jedi. Contradicting all the other Star Wars films. The reading is off the chart. Over 20,000. Silly Yoda. So silly. Luke's robot hand vanishes into the force. An emo chat live. What we don't really talk about is just how terrible the script is. It's like Ryan Johnson wrote one draft, turned it in, and then everyone said, sure, let's go with it. Without asking any questions at, wait a minute. Where have I heard this before? Well, see, again, I mean, and I told Brian this, it's no surprise. I said, I just fundamentally disagree with your concept of this character. Number two, the worst screenplay ever is probably it's Pat, or maybe Jack and Jill, or possibly the mummy. There's a lot of contenders, but it's certainly not the last Jedi. Ryan delivered a great script, very ambitious with a lot of surprises. It has its moments, and yes, I'm gonna be totally fair here. It feels like it was written by a high school student, but like, like a pretty smart high school student. One who thought about his script really, really hard at home before he had to go to bed at night. Ryan Johnson communicated really clearly his intent for the shots very early on. He actually drew storyboards. Like Empire, The Last Jedi opens with the Rebellion fleeing their current base because they've been found out by the First Order. In Empire, we get a little establishment of location, some character stuff with Han, Leia, Luke, Chewbacca, C-3PO, R2-D2, you know, characters we like. We also learn and understand how the Empire tracked them down. This shit just starts wild right out of the gate. So you say to yourself, I guess it doesn't really matter how the First Order found the Rebel base, right? But you know, it adds something. A little something called realism. And pacing, too. Build up. All those wonderful things that make up movies. The Empire probably spent years searching the galaxy with random space probes to find the Rebels. They had no fucking clue where they were. The first starter just shows up out of nowhere right out of the bat. Oh no. The first order comes off as comically powerful, with unlimited resources. It kind of makes you wonder, why are they even bothering chasing down an elderly lady and all of her friends, who only have a handful of spaceships? 
the fuck are they gonna do? None of this is helped either by the fact that Dom Hall Gleason's acting is straight out of Spaceballs. Who do you think you're talking to? Prepare ship! Prepare ship for ludicrous speed! What's the matter, Colonel Sanders? Turkey? The robots are the goofy ones, not the bad guys. Hello? Hello? Yep, I'm still here. Then their plan appears to be this. Poe flies his X-Wing in front of the Dreadnought ship as a distraction. He then goes into attack mode with the intention of taking out the surface cannons, right? He's clearing out our surface cannons. He does this so that the bombers can bomb away. They were in the middle of doing this whole plan because they had all their bombers out and ready to attack. This appears to buy them the time to get the last transport off the ground before the Dreadnought can fire its super cannons which are located underneath the ship, down at the rebel base, and blow it up. Here's a thought for the First Order. You have two clear targets, and you have super cannons. Should you blow up a planetary base that's deserted and isn't going anywhere? Or should you aim those super cannons over here and fire at the big fleet ship that's poised to jump to light speed at any moment? You know, you could always blow up the base at your convenience. Or leave a couple Star Destroyers there. I doubt the Rebellion would come back to a base that's been found. Plus, maybe down on that base, they left some stuff about other Rebels, or other locations, fleet strength, crew dossiers, important belongings, data chips with information on them. Stuff they couldn't really get in a hurry. You know... I think in military terms, they call that intelligence. But clearly, the script is missing that. Ah, fuck it, just blow up the base. Fire on the base! Why not? Just blow it up. Everyone in the First Order is so fucking wildly angry for no real reason. He'll never penetrate our armor. He's not trying to penetrate our armor. Open fire! We need to scramble out fighters. Concentrate all fire on the speeders. Fire on the base! Old school Empire guys were just coldly doing their job. They weren't fucking frothing at the mouth. What are these people insane? Anywho, so I'm still talking about this scene. So the last transport has made it. The last transport's in the air. The evacuation is complete. Leia is happy and says to Poe, okay, I guess call out that whole bomber mission thing and bring your slow ass moving bombers back to the fleet. You know, so that dreadnought can shoot at you and us while you head back with your slow ass moving bombers. Poe rightly says, No, General, we can do this! We have a chance to take out a Dreadnought! Hey, Leia, while we're all here, let's at least try to take this thing out, right? Because that was kind of our mission in the first place? We gotta take out that last cannon or our bombers are toast! Like, that's what we're here doing? And if we don't, it will kill us all. Leia's upset by this plan because she has no idea what she's doing. She could barely even stand up. Time to give it up and go with the Yoda floating wheelchair. Poe also states that this thing, the Dreadnought, is a fleet killer. These things are fleet killers! We can't let it get away! Disengage now, Commander. That is... The like, this is the last of their fleet. There are no other Rebellion fleets, right? 400 of us on three ships. We're the very last of the Resistance. So why not just get the fuck out of there? I can see why Chinese audiences were so confused at this movie and how two feuding militaries could do things that make absolutely no sense in a movie called Star Wars. Box office speaking, they didn't really like this movie. I think it's probably because it was written by some pudgy white folk singer from California who's probably never heard a fly. The military tactics in this movie make about as much sense as me buying condoms. Number one, my wife is dead. Number two, I could no longer get an erection. And number three, my cat ripped off my penis in 1969. Here's the real audio. I was recording my reaction to the first moon landing at the time. Hey, kitty cat, look. Look, this is amazing. A man on the moon, live on television. Could you believe it, kitty? Could you, could you? Anyway, sure, the can you hear me now, your mama prank phone call part was stupid. 
as was the BB-8 plugging water leaks gag boarded on Looney Tunes reality. But the real underlying problem with this movie was a lot of the logic. Logic that was glossed over by great looking visual effects, fast paced action and excitement. You really can't fault how great this movie looks. But right from the first scene there was something off about the writing. And like I always say, you might not have noticed it, but your brain did. Number three, TLDW. Another problem with the script for The Last Jedi is the fact that there's just too much stuff. Uh, so when we put the whole movie together, we had a very big movie. It was too big. Yeah, it's too long, too much stuff. So right now I am signing the final budget sheet. So. While every Star Wars film is just over two hours long, this one takes the cake at two hours and 30 minutes. And in my opinion, story-wise, it should have ended around the one hour and 45 minute mark. Somehow all this stuff with Snoke and the confrontation with Rey and Kylo felt like a climax, as did the Admiral Holdo Lightspeed Kamikaze attack. But this is all a problem with structure, so let's talk about that. While the Snoke throne room scene is clearly reminiscent of Return of the Jedi, I'm going to compare The Last Jedi to The Empire Strikes Back, of course. In Empire, we have sort of a bow-like storyline structure, where our characters are together, then go off on separate adventures, then all end up at the same place for the conclusion. Sitcom format speaking, you have an A story and a B story. In Empire, clearly Luke's training with Yoda and learning about the Force, and then having to confront Darth Vader is the A storyline. In The Last Jedi, we have four C stories. I don't even know how that fucking works. Equal time seems to be given to everything that's going on in the film and nothing seems to have more weight than anything else. Plus things that kind of seemed important just sort of end, more or less unresolved. Plus, we are treated to the old domino effect of bad decision screenwriting model. A model I think works better in a comedy film. Which leads me to my next point. Number four, a comedy of errors. The Last Jedi script kind of plays out like a madcap comedy film. So a stormtrooper and a who now are doing what? At least the rebellion aspects of it do. Let's take a look at a random comedy film. How about National Lampoon's Vacation? So just how did the Griswold family turn their vacation into an armed hostage situation? Well, let's start at the end. Clark has a gun and uses it to take hostages. Clark buys the gun from a gun store. He got the gun because when they got to Wally World, it was too late and it was closed. Clark, what are you doing? An unwelcome passenger, Aunt Edna, dies in their car, forcing them to get rid of the body. Clark robs a motel register in Arizona. Clark robbed the motel because he had no money because the mechanic scammed him. How much you got? Clark got lost trying to find the Grand Canyon, which caused him to crash his car, which caused it to need repairs. Clark gets suckered into taking Aunt Edna along when they stop at Cousin Eddie's. Clark takes the wrong exit and ends up in the ghetto and gets his car vandalized. And Clark got sold the wrong car in the first place because he was stupid. I'm not your ordinary everyday fool, okay? Clark's general incompetence cascades into a series of events which cause things on their family vacation to get worse and worse. It's because he's dumb and he makes bad decisions, like getting a gun out of rage, driving fast to impress Christy Brinkley, trying to find the Grand Canyon by looking for it, falling asleep at the wheel, constantly getting scammed by people everywhere because he's dumb and from Chicago. See, that's why he's a funny character, because he's a buffoon. Waitress. The same can be argued for most of the characters in The Last Jedi. The rebels end up with only a dozen people left alive out of about 400. 400 of us on three ships. Because they got tracked to the salt planet. Is this all that's left? 
and had to escape that. They had to escape there because the First Order was able to run a decloaking scan for their escape crafts. Which was their big fucking plan. They had a cloaking ability for their crafts, but they didn't use it earlier in the film. We ran a decloaking scan, and sure enough, 30 resistance transports had just launched from the cruiser. The First Order ran this decloaking scan because Benicio del Toro told them to. Because he sold out Finn and Rose. Finn and Rose trusted Benicio because he seemed like he knew what he was doing because he broke out of a jail. Why not trust him? They had to use him and not the real Codebreaker because this asshole called the cops on them which led them to jail. And this asshole called the cops on them because they illegally parked their ship on the beach. Which seemed like a dumb thing to do. They went to the casino plan in the first place because they had to go rogue. Admiral Holdo will never agree to this plan. So they asked Maz Kanata for help. Somebody they barely knew. They just met for five minutes in the last movie. They had to go on the secret mission to break the First Order's light speed tracker because Holdo wouldn't tell Poe her plan. And Holdo wouldn't tell Poe her plan because she hates men. You have bet the survival of the Resistance on bad odds and put us all at risk? <laughs> You bet on your own bad odds that the First Order didn't have a pair of these. We could trace the events back to the start almost. Why didn't she just tell him her plan? It kind of made sense. Except for the First Order could physically see the planet you were going to and they were just going to follow you there anyway. Holdo knew the First Order was tracking our big ship. They're not monitoring for the transports. Um, why not? It slipped down to the surface so unnoticed and hide till the First Order passes. Get all our forces down to that resistance base. Let's finish this. That could work. Why wouldn't they be monitoring for little transports? Also, how did Holdo know that? Just a good guess? Hey, there's no life signs on the big ship. It's empty. Maybe they cloaked all their escape crafts and went to that planet that's right fucking there. Maybe they went there. I'm no rocket scientist, but there's a planet there, and and uh, I think they all flew there. She was more interested in protecting the light than she was seeming like a hero. I guess all this crap was supposed to be about leadership or something the moral or the lesson or whatever was that in the rebellion your job was not to rebel you're demoted and to blindly follow your leaders kind of like the first order i just want to know what's going on of course you do i understand holdo had her plan and she was in charge and we need to shake them before we can find a new base so what's our plan don't you dare ask any questions because she's got purple hair so stick to your post and follow my orders. This is one area where this shit ain't like Star Trek at all. If Picard was in a situation where he didn't know what the fuck to do, he would ask everybody for their opinions. He would say, What do you suggest? Everyone would offer up ideas from each character's own unique perspective. Comments. I recommend that I return to the cruiser with an away team. A plasma shock. It would be painful, but it wouldn't cause any physical harm. An interesting suggestion, Lieutenant. What if they're trying to undermine our history for some reason? Some kind of guerrilla war? The Enterprise C would be outmanned and outgunned. Unless we were to rearm them with modern... We can't do that. If we send that ship back with new technology, we'll be altering the past. I agree. We're at war. There's been no formal declaration of war. Not from us, but certainly from them. Perhaps we should reverse course. For all we know, reversing course may be what leads us into the crash. All right, Mr. LaForge. I don't agree. A concussive charge would blow out the security field so we can go in with the phasers and a wide beam, stun everybody, sort it out later. So stick to your post and follow my orders. I have a problem with that kind of rigidity. It seems callous and even a little cowardly. Now if I were on the cruiser in Star Wars The Last Jedi, I'd say, why don't we use that cloaking technology on our escape crafts? Secretly move everyone over to one of those other ships and then light speed out of there. If the tracker's just on Snoke's ship, split everyone up three ways and take your chances. At least two thirds of you will survive. 
That's about 266 people. Much better than the 12 you ended up with. Just give it to me one more time, simpler. So the first order is only tracking us from one destroyer, the lead one. So we blow that one up. But if we but can if we sneak on board the lead destroyer and disable the tracker without them realizing. So we blow that one up. They won't can... realize it's off for one system cycle. About six minutes. So we blow that one up. I like where your head's at, but no, they'd only start tracking us from another destroyer. But if we but can if we sneak on board the lead destroyer so we and blow disable that one the up. tracker without them realizing. They won't we can... realize it's off for one system cycle. About six minutes. Sneak on board. Just give it to me one more time, simple. Disable the tracker. So we blow that one on board. Our fleet escapes before they realize. Give it to me one more time. But if we can we just... sneak on board the lead destroyer and the lead one. So we blow that one up. They won't can... realize it's off for one system cycle. Realize. Or maybe keep popping back and forth at light speed with one of those small crafts. Evacuate everyone somewhere safe. You know, just a little bit at a time. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. They don't seem to care. I literally have tens of ideas. But this lady is technically in charge, so don't ask any questions. <sighs> Picard was a smart man. Agreed. A comedy of errors is what they call it, kids. A series of errors and mistakes, though, is not to be confused with a series of obstacles. You can actually do this, right? Yeah, about that. When the Millennium Falcon encounters an asteroid belt, it's an obstacle. It's not because Han Solo is stupid. Asteroids. When Finn and Rose park their ship on a beach, when there's probably some kind of spaceship parking lot that everyone uses, it's because they're stupid. When they decide to trust some guy who literally sounds like a snake. Remember kids, if he sounds like a snake, it's a mistake. Hey, see, smell it. Take it easy, big F. If he sounds like a snake, it's a mistake. Maybe. Also, if you're questioning my logic that The Last Jedi was more structured as a comedy film, just dip into the deleted scenes. I know I'm not supposed to initiate contact with officers, but I never took you for captain material. Look at you! Captain! Take a look at all this fucking nonsense that was cut from the film. Not sure what my son was up to, but I think he was trying to make a funny movie. <laughs> it's funny when Clark Griswold crashes the family truckster. In that movie, a series of bad decisions, mistakes, Foolish errors, make it a funny movie. It doesn't work in a Star Wars film. It makes all your characters look dumb. Why are you ransacking your own ship? This is why this all seemed weird and bad. When they're on the casino planet and Rose is complaining about like the industrial military complex of the universe or whatever. There's only one business in the galaxy that'll get you this rich. War. Selling weapons. That the First Order buys weapons from from crazy, crazy looking characters in a casino? She should have just said, I hate this place, but there's nothing we could do about it now. We have a mission. Instead, this happens. Stop enjoying this! Stop enjoying this! <laughs> a casino in Star Wars, you know, with, with fancy dressed people, it just seemed... Um, and I, I expressed my fears to, to Ryan, and, um... It was worth it, though. To tear up that town, make him hurt. Now it's worth it. Bitch, are you for real? In a Star Wars film, you need clear obstacles and drama. Wow, it must be really strong well, of you. I've never found any Ow! They cannot keep information for no reason at all just to fulfill some kind of plot twist later. Twists and turns are one thing, but confusing actions and motivations that are literally incomprehensible? Well, that's not acceptable. Once we're done, the Resistance will give you whatever you want. Once you got the buzzer wires. 
How much you got? Number five, point A to point B. Maintain our current course. Steady on. Another thing people take issue with is the low speed chase. You know, I'm okay with this. In a weird way, it kind of reminds me of Star Trek. Fuel status, 15 pounds PSI. Approximately enough for one orbit, sir. Star Trek often dealt with situations involving fuel and ships chasing and or tracking each other. Power loss now at 12%, Captain. Red alert. Star Wars was always more about the locations. Zipping around from one spot to the next without any mention of fuel or how long it would take to get there. That's where the fantasy was. In Star Trek, a light craft could take days or weeks or months to reach another star system. ETA 13, 30 hours, sir. It's not exactly warp speed. When he leaves Hoth, Luke isn't gonna sit in his X-Wing for weeks until he gets to Dagobah. At Impulse, we're not likely to be running into any planets. Not for at least six or seven years. Oh crap! Prepare to jump into hyperspace on my mark! See though, that was before they decided that X-Wings could fly at light speed, which they showed in Return of the Jedi, because all the X-Wings and light crafts had to jump inside the, the big Mon Calamari cruiser before it jumped to light speed. So, I don't know. Was that a mistake in Return of the Jedi, or...? Anyway, the mere fact that a large chunk of the middle of the movie is just big spaceships kind of slowly chasing each other, it was different to say something positive. I would have been fine just cutting back and forth between just that situation and Rey doing things on Luke's planet. However, that's my next point that lends itself to my theory that The Last Jedi is really a madcap comedy. People are always coming and going which deflates the tension of the First Order having them trapped in a low-speed chase. First off, Ryan wrote himself into a hole when he realized that all of his characters were on the main ships being chased by the First Order. Oh crap, he thought. How can Finn and Rose go on a little adventure on some other planet when they're stuck on a fucking ship? Disney wants at least five locations and I've got to meet that quota. So have Finn and Rose sneak out of the side of the Mon Calamari cruiser in some kind of smaller ship and leave. Shit, why doesn't everyone do that? Then when the Rebels leave in the escape ships, which for no reason at all can't go light speed, if this little shitty crappy ship has light speed, then you'd think emergency evacuation crafts would too. Then they suddenly have some kind of cloaking ability? Not like Klingon cloaking ability but sensor cloaking ability. But like the First Order has windows. All you need is a good old pair of these to see them. If the fucking Hubble telescope could see Mars with this clarity from Earth, you'd think the First Order would have some kind of device that could zoom in like a hundred feet and see all the escape crafts leaving. Jesus Christ, even pirates in the 1800s had looking glasses. Send out the TIE Fighters! Send out the TIE Fighters! All these Rebellion escape transports have no weapons and can't go light speed. It's like shooting people in a barrel. I mean fish! Anyway... So then after leaving Canto Bight, Rose, Finn, and Benicio steal some rich guy's ship and then head to Snoke's ship. They slip through the detection grid with magical codes. Ray's also got business on Snoke's ship. So she goes there too, using the Falcon's little escape pod. After her and Kylo fight the bad guys after Snoke gets cut in half, Rey, I guess, then steals Snoke's personal ship? She took Snoke's escape craft. Only then to somehow end up back on the Falcon. What happened to Snoke's ship? And why wasn't she flying that thing into battle? I'm sure the ship of the Supreme Leader of the First Order has gotta have some kind of mega firepower and shields on it, right? Why'd she leave it parked somewhere in the salt? and then get on board the old rust bucket that's piloted by an ape that's infested with Furbies. Fly Snoke's personal ship around and blow shit up. This smells of the old... Oh crap. How do I get Rey down to the salt planet now? Well, how about a throwaway line about how she stole Snoke's ship? She took Snoke's escape craft. And then we'll just never talk about it again. By the way, the salt planet is a favorite vacation spot of this creature. I thought I'd squeeze in a Star Trek reference. I hope you enjoyed it, nerds.
Oh, wait. Here's something. How did Rose, Finn, and the Codebreaker guy plan to get off of Snoke's ship once they smashed up the tracking device? Good time to figure out how we get back to the fleet. I know where the nearest escape pods are. Of course you do. Wouldn't the First Order know that escape pods were launched? And, like, shoot them down? You know, if stormtroopers or, like, low-level ranking military guys went AWOL? This would have been a real good time to use one of those escape pods, don't you think? Come to think of it, would the First Order even have escape pods? Maybe for like the high-ranking officers on the bridge? But shit, how many people are on that ship? Stormtroopers and everyone in the First Order is basically cannon fodder. The escape pod or lifeboat situation is probably worse than the Titanic. Plus, they're all the way in the center of the fucking ship. It would take like 45 minutes for an escape pod to get out of that gigantic ship. In Star Trek, which is much more smarter, the escape pods are always on the outside of the ship. I mean, the Codebreaker guy, whether it was Benicio or the other guy, they were independent contractors, not really part of the rebellion. So I doubt either of them would have been up for a suicide mission. I mean, Rose and Finn might have been. I mean, that ship was big. Maybe go back to the little ship that they, they brought on board? But wouldn't somebody have found that ship? Like, like a stormtrooper be like, hey, what's that? And then they'd hit like the alarm button. I don't know, it just don't make sense. It's just like they're doing things without thinking. Good time to figure out how we get back to the fleet. And they're making one mistake after the other. Just like Clark Griswold. But this chapter's called From Point A to Point B. Meaning, how do people get from here to there? It's either really stupid, or not thought out at all, or brushed over, or it happens so fast you don't even really notice it. Like my next point. This is the absolute worst thing that happens. And no, I'm not talking about the, oh shit, I totally forgot about where BB-8 is. Um, I guess he somehow got inside an ATST, which conveniently has a detachable top that falls off, so that we could see him piloting it. I guess? I guess he could shoot out like a cable. How did he even get up there? Up up the cable the cockpit. Cockpit. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how Rose and Finn get inside the rebel base on the salt planet. They conveniently steal some kind of first order ship after killing Captain Flasma. They fly it down to the salt planet real quick and fast. And conveniently and with precision timing are able to fly it into the base doors before they close. They're the only First Order ship that makes it into the base before the doors close. Just them, not anybody else. Jesus, that's some fucking good odds. Maybe you should go back to Cantino Bright and put some money on a slot machine. I don't even remember this happening the first time I watched the movie. It happens so fast you don't even really have time to think about it. It's just like, oh yeah, no Rose and Finn are inside the rebel base. And it's a good thing too they didn't kill anybody. Look out, look out, run! Don't get smashed by the sliding spaceship! It's another one of those how do I get my characters from here to there situation. Eh, I'll just, I'll just slap this together. No one will notice, it'll happen so fast. Was this movie even thought out at all ahead of time? What a shit show! Speaking of a shit show, let's take a look at this short film recently created by and starring Ryan Johnson. It was made exclusively for the StarWars.com website. Number six, the other C plot. Again, as previously stated, I'm not here to take a huge dump on this movie. I have a toilet for that. Many have called The Last Jedi prequel bad. <laughs> Jesus Christ, how racist. Oh my God. Ryan Johnson played his hand in a poker game. 
But it wasn't that strong. You have to lay down all your chips on, on it in front of a lot of really good poker players and say, this is the right decision based on nothing but this little tingle you get in your stomach. And, and you know, that's scary. That's really terrifying. Um, I would be worried if everybody across the board was like, yeah, that was a good movie. And then there are other people who walk out just, I mean, literally saying that was the worst movie I've ever seen. Having those two extremes to me is, you know, is the mark of uh, the type of movie that I want to make, so. He didn't want to give the audience what it wanted, what it craved. And what it craved was the familiar, the heroic. Good luck. The adventure. He was kind of like a school teacher that was rewarding us with movie day. Fat of crates, shot by shot. Uh, any questions, any answers, greatly appreciated. Page one. But instead of showing us something fun, he showed us something fun but educational too. That's not fun. The audience wanted Luke to come back out of hiding, show that he was a true Jedi badass and help Rey stop Snoke and Ren. Maybe at least temporarily. Instead, Luke wanted nothing to do with anything. It was a cheap move. Like I said, a rock in a hard place. The idea that Luke was on an island, cut off from the Force, and basically just wanting to die was one of the more interesting aspects of the movie. Rey wanted help. Luke finally agreed, but then was like, nope. Did you hear a word I just said? I think what? I'm gonna walk out with a laser sword and face down on the whole First Order? Right now I feel like I take on the whole Empire myself. I know what you mean. But then Rey finally just says fuck it and leaves. Good for her. She's intrigued by trying to save Kylo Ren, who seems like he's kind of interested in, in helping her too. They got this weird connection that's, that's different. You got me, movie. I'm interested now. What are you gonna do for me next? Are you gonna fuck me in the ass? You better watch your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Once Ray left, that should have been the last time we saw Luke, at least in this film. And here's how the film should have ended. Join me. There, you got a solid cliffhanger and a satisfactory ending. A big bad guy is dead. His big bad ship is ripped apart in a self-sacrifice by what should have been Leia. And most importantly, what will be the future of this new Kylo and Rey alliance? Romance? A new chaotic neutral Jedi Sith breed? So many new things, so many new ideas. Oh. Blow that piece of junk. Out of the sky! I guess he's still bad. It's time to let old things die. The Sith, the Jedi, the Rebels, let it all die. He wants to tear down the First Order and the Resistance. Okay, that's interesting. The Resistance is in that mine. Push through. Then he still goes after the Resistance with the First Order. Then he makes himself the new Supreme Leader. Long live. Then the movie ends with Luke coming back to save the day, but he really doesn't. He stalls so that everyone can escape. Skywalker's doing this so we can survive. Which only serves to make Kylo Ren more angry and more embarrassed. First he gets beat by a girl who has never used a lightsaber before, of which Snoke personally chides him on. You were unbalanced. Bested by a girl who had never held a lightsaber, you failed! Then he gets beat by an elderly hologram. All those people saw him fighting with an astral projection, or whatever. You'd think he'd have the force sense to tell that that was just like a fake thing. You know how you could like read someone's feelings when you're a Jedi or Sith? I sense something, a presence I've not felt since. You could sense things. He would be like sensing nothing, right? If he had any kind of skills. God, how embarrassing. And I thought getting kicked out of the portly gentleman was embarrassing. I kept splitting too many pants in the dressing room. Oh no! Ray learns that Luke didn't know what he was talking about at all. 
It's not about lifting rocks. Because the force literally is about moving rocks. Also, this random little boy has Jedi powers. So it is some kind of inherited ability. Or else all kids would be able to use the force, right? Dear God, was everything you said wrong? The force is not a power you have. And beyond that, something truly special. The potential of your bloodline. Go drink some more monster tit milk, you weird hobo. Then we're right back where we started. The resistance is on the run, and the First Order is still chasing after them. No real big revelations, just the death of two major characters that represented the quote, old ways of the old films. It's time to let old things die. The Supreme Sith Lord and the Jedi Master. What we're left with is a sort of Sith in charge of the First Order, and a girl who has a whole bunch of misinformation. Luke wanted the Jedi to die. It's time for the Jedi to end. Why? But boy, oh boy, look how it helped out your friends. Those Jedi books are worthless. Even Yoda said it. A pile of old books. <laughs> the sacred Jedi texts. Ooh, read them, have you? Well, I mean, age turners, they were not. She tried to burn them down with lightning, but then she took the books. I guess to study them further. Uh, so they have value. Did she take the books so that she could teach others? That's not what Luke wanted. Who the fuck knows what's going on? Our black and white good versus evil space saga is now a muddled, ambiguous gray. All those wonderful moments in the original films have filled you with excitement, thrills, chills, action and adventure love and romance, and heartfelt emotion. For some reason, all rang hollow in this movie. They felt forced or rehashed or lacked real emotion. And the parts that did stick with you, stuck with you for the wrong reasons. They made you feel sick, confused, awkward, uncomfortable, strange, embarrassed, disgusted, and annoyed. The only part that had any emotional weight to it was when Luke was saying goodbye to Leia. And really, that was just because it was those two characters that you liked. And what happened shortly thereafter with Carrie Fisher in real life. Spoilers, she died! Number seven. Little details make a big picture. Finally, to end on a good note, I'd like to point out some of the great little details in the movie. It's empty. They're just trying to pull our attention away. Because it's not all bad, kids. I really liked how low-tech the First Order's monitors were. In keeping with Star Wars tradition, they were blocky, old-looking technology. I was very happy with that. It's neat when during Kylo and Rey's conversations, Kylo gets a little water on his hands, you know, because Rey's out by the water. It's a nice little foreshadowing to what happens with Luke later on. I really like this moment, too. Our distress signal's been received at multiple points, but no response. It's like we got it when Billy Lord said it. They've heard us, but no one's coming. But then this lady said it again, just slower and dumber so that we doubly understood. I'm so dumb. I also like this detail too, when after the most epic and amazing thing ever to happen in the history of Star Wars happens, these background extras are just chatting about something. Shouldn't everyone's eyes be fucking glued to the windows? Oh my god, did you see what the fuck just happened? Hey, how's the weather? Did you catch the game last week? Hey, do you remember when Finn had a terrible concussion and was suffering from dementia? And he thought his little rusty piece of crap ship would stop a super laser? That it wouldn't just get incinerated? Or shot down by a million laser blasts before it even got close? How silly. What a fun moment. You gotta get your head checked out, Finn. Cause you're dumber than Clark Griswold. Hey then, remember when Rose crashed her little piece of crap ship right into Finn's? Risking both horrible back injuries and death in order to stop him from crashing into the super laser? <laughs> that was pretty fucking risky. 
And it's like, love is the only way. And, and she kisses him and he's like, what? I don't like you at all. Bitch, are you for real? And then in the background, the rebellion dies. How hysterically terrible. I mean, great. Also, do you remember the fight scene after Snoke was dead? When his guards pointlessly fought Rey and Kylo? Huh. <laughs> If I were one of those guards, I would have just ran away. Because clearly they're totally inept. They kind of just stand there waiting awkwardly for one guard to finish attacking before they attack. Hey you, where are you going? What are you doing? Hey, wait, you, why did you run over there? And what the heck is this guy waiting for? Can they even see what they're doing in those helmets? Hey, why did you go over there? Do you remember when Luke said... The Force is not a power that you have? Uh, sure it is. Just look at Leia. She didn't do shit to develop her power. It was just inherited. You have that power too. In time, you'll learn to use it as I have. She's always sitting down. But yet she could survive the cold vacuum of space and Admiral Akbar, and nobody else can? Sure does seem like some kind of inherited Jedi power that she has. Blow that piece of junk out of the sky! Hey, do you remember when Kylo Ren was so mad at the Millennium Falcon that he ordered all their TIE fighters to attack it? Oh, they hate that ship! You know, so that they could leave all the ships trying to attack their super laser free to attack their super laser. She drew them off! All of them! She? How did he know Rey was on board the Millennium Falcon? Or was he calling the ship a she? She may not look like much, but she's got it where it counts, kid. Oh, jeez. I wasn't expecting such outdated and sexist sailor talk from such a progressive film. How dare they? I'm protesting. Come on, Antifa. Let's get Star Wars next. Number eight. The circle of confusion is complete. To get what I was doing, I was doing a whole bunch of things. If you thought the opening of The Last Jedi was odd and messed with your brain, let's talk about the tone and visuals and general attitude of the ending. Now, I know Ryan didn't want his film compared to Empire, but we really need to do that here. First of all, Luke starts off as he did at the end of A New Hope. Ah, nobody, do you read me? Happy, plucky, idealistic. Then a snow monster mauls his face and tries to eat him alive. Then he's like, Oh my god, this fucking galaxy's a nightmare. That was traumatic. Then Yoda lays out some real scary shit to him. I'm not afraid. You will be. You will be. Then he has visions of his friends dying. He cuts off a ghost of Darth Vader and sees his fucking face inside a de decapitated head. He's unable to rescue his friends. He gets his fucking hand chopped off and is told the most evil man in the galaxy is his father. I am your father. Overall, a pretty shitty, reality-hitting day. Now stick with me. In this film, Rey is off to meet the legend, Luke Skywalker. The Force, a Jedi. All of it. It's all true. Who turns out to be a big homeless asshole who's fucking rude to her. Ow! He tells her that the Jedi are shitty and a bunch of failures, leaving her with absolutely no hope in him. Only with Kylo Ren. And even though he kills Snoke to save her, he still wants to murder all of her friends. Plus, she's literally witness to the deaths of mostly all of the Rebellion at this point. Like, from her perspective, she went off to get Luke to help everybody, and she totally failed them. Here's where Luke is at the same story moment in Empire. Here's where Rey is. She likes that. So then in Empire, the Rebellion fleet is limping along at a slow pace. Another visual similarity could be like a beat army heading back to its base in defeat. The music is mostly somber. Our characters are licking their wounds, so to speak. 
The music is still slightly hopeful, but with a twinge of melancholy. Just perfect. And The Last Jedi... The Millennium Falcon is speeding ahead at light speed, which visually indicates adventure and action and fun. That's where the fun begins. On board, it's a fun reunion or something. People seem to be in generally good spirits, even though 46,000 rebels died, leaving only 12 people left alive. There's hugging and handshaking, and all the shots are very reminiscent of the ending of Return of the Jedi. Where, of course, the Empire was totally defeated. So you're like, everything that just happened was really bad. There should be a fucking funeral dirge playing. Everyone should be shell-shocked and sitting there in silence as the Millennium Falcon limps along at five miles an hour, spewing black smoke out of the back. But this is Disney and Mr. Not What You'd Expect. I don't want to freak anybody out here, but I think we just made a Star Wars movie. So you're literally left scratching your head in confusion as to how to feel. Should I be happy now? Why is everyone happy? We have everything we need. Again, you might not have noticed it, but your brain did. One thing that should be noted here. It seems like Ryan Johnson is a pretty good guy. Everyone had nothing but nice things to say about him. And Ryan, not once did he show any type of anger or kind of, not once was he was he rude or was he, did he let the pressure of all of this get to him? And it's pressure. Well, almost everyone. He's an <laughs> I think she was joking, but I'm not sure. I know this guy really didn't like him, but that's another story. No matter how this comes out, if I'm wonderful, it's because of him. And if it's terrible, it's also his fault. He seems like a pretty nice guy. He liked to laugh. <laughs> and maybe he was just a little bit nervous to be working on such a big production. Shit, I would be. He also just wanted to write a good script and make a movie that was unexpected. Maybe a little refreshing. A different take on Star Wars. And for that, I give him respect. If I don't mess it up. <laughs> The problem was that he failed spectacularly at it on every level. Oh, come on, you can do it! No! Then it was just a matter of really being honest with myself. Like, is, is that what's best for this trilogy? Is that what should happen here? And just questioning that over and over again. So you know what, kids? Number nine, I might just sit out. I might go sit in the park and feed the birds. Watch the sunset, walk on the beach, listen to the waves crash on the shore. Fuck, do anything in the world for two hours, then watch the next one. And while I would never suggest a boycott, boy, I do love cots. Ha 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 ha!